Flight, one of the most extraordinary adaptations ever developed in nature. The ability to take to the air has been a gift bestowed onto the many organisms that call this planet home. A concept that we ourselves have been fascinated by, often taking inspiration from the world around us as we took our own tentative steps to take to the skies. One group of creatures that have truly captured the imagination of the air were some of the largest and oldest ever to fly, the pterosaurs. Pterosaurs are fascinating creatures, coming in all manner of shapes, sizes, and wingspans, each one pushing the limits of the skies and our current understanding with each one we discover. However, even pterosaurs had their own small leaps to make towards the air. One pterosaur exemplifies these early beginnings, shedding light on how these animals came to rule the air millions of years ago. With a characteristic oversized head on a surprisingly small set of wings, this was one of the first pterosaurs ever discovered, known as Dimorphodon. Dimorphodon is one of the earliest pterosaurs known in the fossil record, both in its origins in the early Jurassic around 195 to 190 million years ago, to being a key representative of early pterosaurs and their evolution. Not only was it one of the earliest known pterosaurs, but it was also one of the first pterosaurs ever discovered, alongside the likes of Pterodactylus and Rampyrhynchus. And it's thanks to this unique status that Dimorphodon is one of the most crucial pterosaurs ever known. Originally uncovered in what is now Dorset during the 1820s, Dimorphodon was discovered by renowned paleontologist Mary Anning, from a site known as the Jurassic Coast. When it was found and presented to academics, it was thought to have been a species of Pterodactylus, initially named Pterodactylus macronix. While you'd think the differences would be obvious, pterosaurs were incredibly new to science at the time and just as rare, with so few species available on hand, scientists could hardly fathom that these odd reptiles once soared across our skies, let alone whole groups of them. However, in the 1850s, a bizarre puffin-like skull with teeth was uncovered, attached to one of these brand new skeletons. Following such a discovery, Sir Richard Owen published that this was not only a distinct species, but a brand new genus of pterosaur, and thus Dimorphodon macronix was born. The name Dimorphodon stems from its distinct sets of teeth. Unlike most reptiles, Dimorphodon had two different sets of teeth in its beak, including large fang-like teeth on the tip of its upper jaw, and a full set of pointed needle-like teeth on the lower jaw. These peculiar teeth sat inside a massive head relative to the rest of its body giving the tiny pterosaur some certainly odd proportions. However, these traits weren't just for show, with its large jaws and specialized teeth allowing Dimorphodon to forage and capture food. So the question is, what was Dimorphodon eating with these weird sets of teeth? The debate of Dimorphodon's diet is a topic that certainly evolved with our understanding of the animal, and it's a question almost as old as its discovery. Generally, it's long been the consensus that Dimorphodon ate small animals, using its small but sharp interlocking teeth to snatch and ensnare small prey. Though which small animals in particular has been the subject of discourse. Traditionally, Dimorphodon was depicted as an insectivore, snatching small flying insects like dragonflies out of the air with its oversized jaws with its small body limiting it from capturing much of anything else. However, fossil evidence points to adaptations that express the contrary. In fact, it seems Dimorphodon wasn't well suited at all for a diet primarily of insects. Instead, most evidence points to a diet of different types of small prey, with the current consensus being that Dimorphodon preferred small vertebrates like lizards and small fish. Even as far back as the late 80s, Dimorphodon has been depicted as having a piscivorous diet, or a diet consisting of fish. 
with paleontologists such as Bob Bakker reconstructing the animal ensnaring fish in their jagged teeth, similar to other known fish-eating pterosaurs like Rampharynchus, as well as their superficial similarities to puffins. However, the idea fell out of favor when testing indicated that Dimorphodon lacked the same adaptations of fish-catching animals. Not that they couldn't eat fish, but more so that they probably didn't make up a consistent part of its diet. If anything, Dimorphodon's adaptations indicate that it was an animal that preferred a life on dry land. Mark Whitten argued that instead of eating insects, being too large to survive and lacking adaptations necessary to survive on a diet of insects, he proposed that Dimorphodon specialized in hunting small vertebrates, like lizards and small mammals, a hypothesis that later proved true with the evidence of dental wear on Dimorphodon's teeth, providing substantial evidence in the way of Dimorphodon feeding on small vertebrates. Dimorphodon's skull as a whole was comically huge in proportion to its body. It's a trait it shares with many of its close relatives, the family of pterosaurs known as Dimorphodontids. Dimorphodontids are an especially ancient lineage of pterosaur, representing some of the earliest members of these flying reptiles, dating as far back as the late Triassic period over 200 million years ago sharing the same odd teeth and proportionally huge heads like that of their namesake. As you may have guessed, being a family that's so old means that Dimorphodontids were pretty basal on the pterosaur family tree, and display many of the traits characteristic to early pterosaurs, including shorter wings, jagged teeth, and long stiff tails with fan-shaped rudders at the very tips. Pterosaur evolution is quite a mystery, in that we don't exactly know when they came to be, at least as we know them. We know that their closest relatives are dinosaurs, and we also know that their common ancestry split by the Middle Triassic period. However, there's a huge gap between that time and what would essentially become basal pterosaurs and it's essentially difficult to decipher what the ancestors of pterosaurs might have been like, from their appearances to how they took flight in the first place. As mentioned before, pterosaurs themselves got their start in the mid-Triassic period, with their earliest members dating back as far as 217 to 219 million years ago, with pterosaurs like Preonodactylus, Eudimorphodon, and Patinosaurus. Patinosaurus in particular was once thought to be a close relative of Dimorphodon, and one could easily see why when comparing the two, with Dimorphodon sharing many similar traits to this early genus of pterosaur, including the oversized puffin-shaped head and the long rudder-like tail. And while they aren't considered directly related, Dimorphodon sharing these traits makes it abundantly clear that it is a perfect example of an early pterosaur. It's thanks to early pterosaurs like Dimorphodontids that we, at the very least, have a small sneak peek into the earliest days of pterosaurs and what they might have been like. Lacking the specialized adaptations for soaring, Dimorphodon and others like it spent more time on the ground or in the trees, flying over short distances just as far and fast enough to get where they need to go. A surprise to be sure that despite being a flying reptile, Dimorphodon itself seemed to have been uniquely adapted to a life beneath the sky rather than soaring above the ground, with proportionally smaller wings relative to its body, and a rather robust skeleton for a pterosaur, inhibiting long-distance soaring or gliding due to the added weight. By contrast, their penchant for spending time on the ground came with a surprising set of adaptations including erect arms and legs that stood upright beneath their bodies instead of the sprawling gait of other reptiles, with large robust hands and feet with notably strong hind limbs with trenchant claw bones, and large hooked claws on their hands, a trait that gave the type species its name, Dimorphodon macronix, with macronix meaning large claw. How Dimorphodon was moving on the ground, however, was a bit of a contentious topic in early years. 
During the earlier years of pterosaur paleontology, there was some back and forth on whether or not Dimorphodon was a creature that walked on two legs, a biped, or walked on four legs, a quadruped. Some had suggested that Dimorphodon was a bipedal creature, running and hopping along the ground with its strong hind limbs and long stiff tail, having been interpreted as evidence for this bipedal stance. Others had already figured out that Dimorphodon was a quadruped, crawling and walking along the ground on all four of its limbs, a hypothesis that became fact with the discovery of pterosaur trackways. Coming from different parts of the world, several pterosaur trackways from different types of pterosaurs in different eras have been uncovered and studied, revealing a wealth about pterosaur locomotion and behavior. Amongst the most common of these trends with each of these trackways, reveal that pterosaurs were not only walking on all four limbs when on the ground, but they were far from awkward, moving as fluidly and competently as any other land animal. And with its own specialized limbs, it's likely that Dimorphodon was also moving on all fours as a pterosaur extremely well adapted for terrestrial life. And yet, despite Dimorphodon's affinity for the ground, we can already see the earliest signs of what made pterosaurs such masters of the skies. From what remains we do have of Dimorphodon's wings, show that despite not being a specialized glider, it was already showing adaptations for being an aerial acrobat. Like other pterosaurs, its wings were composed of an elongated fourth finger that was attached to a stretch of thin, wide tissue composed of muscle fibers and stiff tissues. The shape of the wing was also very aerodynamic, with a round front and sharp flattened back end forming what was known as an aerofoil, which directly shapes the pressure around it, while the wing's wide surface area gave Dimorphodon its lift. And while the shorter wings of Dimorphodon meant it wasn't soaring like an eagle, the current consensus surrounding Dimorphodon's aerodynamic abilities portrayed Dimorphodon as an animal that was more of a frantic, short-distance flyer that would rely more on rapid flapping of its wings due to lacking a larger wingspan to carry them on air thermals. Think less falcon, more fowl. When it wasn't on the ground or in the air, Dimorphodon seemed to have also spent much of its time in the trees, with strong limbs and hooked claws making it a combatant climber a trait fairly common amongst most basal pterosaurs, and may very well be the pressure that not only encouraged the evolution of Dimorphodon's strong limbs, but the drive for flight in all pterosaurs. A long-standing hypothesis for the evolution of flight in pterosaurs centers on a potentially arboreal ancestor, one that would leap from tree to tree starting as a hopper, before evolving into a glider similar to a flying squirrel, and eventually, a powered flyer. It's fairly in line with how pterosaurs themselves are able to take off, and how even pterosaurs as tall as a giraffe were able to take to the air. Studies from the late 2000s, combined with trackways showing off pterosaur takeoffs, revealed that these ace reptiles likely used a method called quad launching using the power of their forelimbs to vault themselves forward with a hefty leap, pushing themselves into the air before using strong, rapid downstrokes to generate lift and take off into the sky. Vampire bats use a very similar form of quad launching today, using their own strong forelimbs to vault into the air before rapidly flapping into the night. And just like pterosaurs, Vampire bats are very, very good moving on the ground. It's a method of takeoff that's actually quite energy efficient, arguably more so than that of birds. And it was found that while both methods of launching require flapping for lift, quad launching only took a few brief flaps by comparison, allowing bats and consequentially pterosaurs to take off while expending less energy. And by expending less energy, Along with taking a quadrupedal stance, it allowed pterosaurs in particular to rapidly grow larger, several times in several independent groups at several different points in their evolutionary history. 
Dimorphodon's own strong forelimbs and aerodynamic wing shape, pterosaurs were already evolving these energy efficient adaptations for flight this early in their evolution. A key showcase of small tree dwelling flappers on their way to becoming soaring master flyers of the Mesozoic skies. Dimorphodon itself comes from a time when pterosaurs were in the midst of a brand new frontier, the Cinemurian. This was the very start of the Jurassic period, a mere 5 million years after the end Triassic extinction that ended the previous period. It was at this stage that the world was anew, rich with opportunities left by the disappearance of previous species and environments, and the emergence of new ones, opportunities early pterosaurs like Dimorphodon took advantage of. Dimorphodon itself lived in what was once a coastal swamp of what is now Dorset, amongst forests of conifers, ginkgos, and other gymnosperms, fluttering from tree to tree or foraging along the ground. Alongside Dimorphodon were other groups of animals on the dawn of their own ascension to dominance, the dinosaurs. One in particular known as Solidosaurus an armored herbivorous dinosaur that, like Dimorphodon itself, was an early form that was key in shaping its lineage. Just like the pterosaurs, dinosaurs had also first evolved during the mid to late Triassic, splitting off from a shared common ancestor as their closest known relatives, and just like said relatives, were also beginning to explore and expand these brand new roles and body plans in the early Jurassic as they began to flourish in the future. While Dimorphodon would eventually fall into extinction by the middle of the Jurassic period, its fate was a bit more graceful than others. While the continents continued to split apart and its habitat began to vanish, pterosaurs like Dimorphodon continued to spread and diversify into untold amounts of species and niches, evolving into new forms of pterosaur that would inherit many of the enhanced traits honed by Dimorphodon and other early pterosaurs, with which they would continue to rule the skies for another 130 million years until the very end of the Mesozoic. In the modern day, Dimorphodon would go on to shape our understanding of pterosaurs for centuries, as one of the most crucial foundations for not only the study of pterosaurs, but the field of paleontology itself. This status has not only made Dimorphodon one of the most important animals in the fossil record, but also one of the most frequently used by those whose imaginations have been sparked by it, having been featured in various TV shows, video games, and films, including the Jurassic World trilogy. Small in stature, but mighty in its contributions, Dimorphodon is without a doubt one of the most extraordinary pterosaurs ever discovered one of the most extraordinary animals ever discovered, period. Dimorphodon makes itself clear as a key leap forwards in understanding pterosaurs and their mastery of the air. <laughs>